So why would you want to, why do we need to encode variables? Because this is like factor data, ca ca character data that could be a factor. Sometimes numeric data, right? That is non-ordinal or something like that, like a class. Yeah, so they can be ordinal. Yeah, or, uh, we might need that because uh, we want to use a, a model which is uh, more uh, comfortable doing dealing with numbers, for example. So we might want to encode our categorical variable, categorical variable to into numbers. So let's wait yeah. for Steven to, to get in and then. Yeah, it seems like some some or some models only work when you encode yeah, it said, them. Yeah, um, you don't need to encode tree models, rule based models. So that's random forest. What's a rule based model? Is that like a decision tree? Although that's a tree, isn't it? <laughs> it's in the damn name. Come on, man, wake up. <laughs> Yeah, I, I think got... they, they, they are uh, following rules and in, uh, all the old models uh, follow some rules. So... But like a, you know, a classic ANOVA and stuff like that, it doesn't like, it has to encode character variables as like one, two, three, four, like factors, right? Um, but is that the sort of encoding that it's referring to? Because like the... Is, is so like the table 17.1 table that shows like the, the 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 grid of the houses and the the type of house that they are and it's like zero one zero one zero one is that what they call one hot encoding do you want to share the, the chapter maybe so we have uh, oh a better the, frame the, of the reference body. yeah sure yeah, that is the the, the one hot encoding. Because this this is what I'm talking about here is this table. So it's um, is that big enough? I can make it bigger. I can see it. That's okay. But it's saying a two family condominium probably is um, is one out of all this matrix. Mm hmm. And duplex is duplex and so on. I, I'm not really sure I understand this completely, but uh, but it's just labeling the data as as just, yes or not this thing mm -hmm. as a column. Right. Okay. All right. I guess I was thinking about it in other terms, like... Uh, like taking like like when we do uh, you're doing like an ANOVA or something and you take uh, you take data and you have a factor and it's just one two three four and that's if it's like not ordered because because one the order of one two three and four don't mean anything in the model yeah and they're just doing, indicators yeah if yep. you're doing like an ordinal analysis you use you need to use different types of models for that. Because the order of the factor matters. Um, kind of like, you know, when we do like, I, I do some sensory data too. So it's like, you know, you mm -hmm. have like, I like this a little bit. I like this a lot. I like this extremely, you know. I don't like this extremely. And so there's an order to that. Mm -hmm. uh, the, thing, um, the thing I found interesting is that uh, they show that you can uh, encode a categorical variable using a model. So general linear model, for example. Do, do you uh, need me to scroll somewhere? Where, where should I go? Yeah, yeah, a, 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 a little bit further down. So this is uh, uh, this is why we need and um, we just said no. If you go uh, forward a little bit more. Well, there's an ordinal one. These are uh, encoding ordinal predictors. Uh, that, that, that's not the, the bit I wanted. Um, it's a little bit 
put it down when he said uh, here we there's a uh, few methods that we can use for encoding predictors and one is this one effect or uh, likelihood uh, encoding this uh, bit is written in uh, italic effect or likelihood uh, encoding yeah this is the first method he mentioned, um, and um, uh, basically uh, this uh, um, still doesn't, uh, so th this is what we do uh, without knowing uh, that we are doing this thing. So in this case, we, we are encoding uh, underneath, so without doing anything, a categorical variable, which is neighborhood in this case, mm -hmm. using a, a, another predictor. So price. Yeah, the sales price. So basically, making the mean of the sales price, we we, we are automatically encoding neighborhood into classes, uh, and that so we group it by neighborhood and then encoding by the, the main of the, the, the sales grants. So that, that's the first one. Then uh, if, if you scroll a, a little bit more down, uh, here, here, the, the, uh, a little bit up, but okay. So with embed, there's, there's few step functions like step uh, link, code, link GLM. code GLM. Okay, no, no. yeah. Must mean something. What is LIN yeah. code? Does anybody know? Yeah, you can. Uh, or L in code, maybe. <laughs> LIN code. I don't know. God. Let's look it up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let's let's look it up. Or so is you it can a basically one? use it a, a generalized linear model. Uh, it's, it's yeah. A... Yeah. Lin linear encode. Let's see. Oh, okay. Maybe. Here we go. Oh yeah, supervised factor conversions into linear functions using likelihood encodings. Oh, likelihood, likelihood encoding. encoding. There likelihood. You go. There you go. Okay. Ah, okay. Okay. L encoding. Well, because if it was if it was likelihood, the function name would be this long. So. Right. Uh -huh. Roll off your screen. Yeah. Sorry. Go ahead, Frederick. I I, I interrupted. Uh, so I was saying these steps use a generalized linear model. So basically, you you make it, you use a model to um, in uh, within this function, set link code GLM. You encode the neighborhood using uh, sales price through a generalized linear model. Yeah. So I didn't. I haven't thought about that. So, I think, I think you can I, explain. I think, so, so it, it's the same thing as this, right? You're, you're instead mm -hmm. of having this be a, a factor or a character vector, you're saying that Northridge is five point five or whatever, and Iowa dot and railroad is four point nine something. And so then it's a number rather than uh but it <coughs> but it incorporates sales price so then you're not you you shouldn't use sales price that's what i want to know in your model like that doesn't that kind of that's weird to me isn't it because you're like you're literally it, correlating it feels like a, a data leak yeah i mean then then you end up with a variable that is heavily correlated with the outcome yeah i wonder what the the rule of thumb is on that like if you should like have like a, a sample that you set aside that you use for that i i don't know i don't know <laughs> uh, uh this one is just um i think it's just a specification that the outcome is uh sales price it's redundant. I, I believe that to uh, repeat this because you already put that uh, in the recipe. 
but uh, I don't know if you can use another one instead. Maybe you can encode a uh, neighbor into another variable. Why are you using a, a receipt with uh, a different uh, outcome? But that's that's the outcome. So uh, um, I I haven't looked at. Uh, Have you? Has anyone ever used this? I'm just curious. I, I feels like something I probably should use maybe at some point in the future, but actually on my current job, uh, we do something like this, but we do actually set aside a set of data to avoid data leaks. So I wonder if that's just kind of the general advice for that. I might look into that some more. So how does we it, don't how we does... don't we don't use the whole training set to do the encoding. We use like a subset to try to prevent yeah leakage. And then would you use like resampling or or stuff like that to to like cuz every time you run that on a small sample you would get a different answer, right? Yeah, you would get yeah, exactly. Um so yeah, I I feel like there's probably more to this that yeah, that again, it's kind of something I'll probably chase down after we have our meeting. Well, if you have any insight <laughs> Let us or we know. can ask people on the Slack. We can ask people on the Slack. I oh, know. that's a good call. That's a good call. I might do that later today. Okay. Oh, here we go. Does encoding labels cause data leakage? Data science stack exchange. Oh, right. Google. Oh, I thought it was here. It's in Google. All right. Uh -huh. Because when when you do all that uh, uh, manually, you you can encode this. This, this is. Um, and a feature, an helpful thing that helps you to encode more uh, complex categorical variables. But if you want to do that manually, what do you do? You, you, you divide your uh, variable, categorical variable within uh, uh, groups that you think are more, are more suitable, and then you assign an index to them. So you build up a vector of numbers which correspond to your uh, group of categories that you have just created. And this does automatically. But uh, the thing I, I, I like to understand it a little bit better is how does a model work for encoding this uh, category of variables? We have uh, coefficients that we estimate. So these are well, the, the probabilities linked to an estimate value, such as the mean, the number of times, the frequencies of these uh, particular categories that repeat themselves within the vector. Should, should I scroll somewhere specific, uh, Federica? Are you still talking about this or? I mean, uh, th there are three three types of encoding. You know? the, oh. the first one we just mentioned, it, um, then if you scroll a bit down, you, you find another one. So Predictors. this is- That's what we just did. Yeah. And then effects encoding with partial pooling. Okay, this is, there is partial pooling, they, the, the, that's fine, the bit is fine. That's partial pooling and pooling. It's oh, pooling. guys, you know what? I was just reading something. Um, sorry, I'm kind of jumping in. Um, yeah. But I think I think the reason it's okay to do this is if you've done the train test split already. Yes, you are using your training set to do that encoding, but you're not using your test set, so you're still checking to see if your encoding is gonna generalize because, because you didn't cheat by using any data in your test set to do the training. So I, th I think that's the, the justification, but I, I, I can follow up and with somebody who knows more than I do and see what I find out, so yeah. Sorry about that, but yeah, it was just bugging me. <laughs> I had to look into it. No, I appreciate the follow up. And if you uh, have any no more, worries. let us know because um... No, I think it's a good question. These aren't things I use very much, so I don't really know. 
What, uh, what is, um, so they, they use partial pooling and no pooling and partial pooling with, with the step functions. Yeah, so here we have a step likelihood encoded mixed with no pooling, right? The first, or partial pooling? Where does it say that? Or maybe that's without, and then you say, no. So you see the you see the outcome of that partial pooling versus no pooling. Yeah, that's nice because they they join uh, all the the result with the the training set. So the no pooling, the partial pooling, and the training set they all uh, join together, and then made a plot. So you can see that uh, no pulling and partial pulling in this uh, contest are uh, probably releasing a, the, sa the same results. Yeah, only a this... couple of them along the line, you know? Yeah. Okay, so they say the neighborhoods with the fewest homes have been pulled up or down. So that just means that maybe there's more variation in those neighborhoods and therefore they can't capture it as easily, perhaps. Okay, cool. Should I keep scrolling? Are we ready for feature hashing? <laughs> okay, I was I was just looking at this one, which is uh, the, the this hashing. No, 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 the-, the Feature hashing? The feature, feature hashing, yes. This, this one is um, uh, the hashing encoding. So when you encode that uh, into hashing, um, so prefitted uh, values, which creates, but for me, uh, again, a category of variables. You cannot consider that numbers. If you want to calculate the mean or the standard deviation, you cannot do it. So they stick categorical for me. But they are encoded in uh, this way. It's, we input the Bria Dale to this hashing function. <laughs> they transform this into this long uh, string. number string numbers and better string. So. I'm, I'm trying to figure out why yeah. this would be useful. Maybe this is just an oversimplified example. If you were actually to use a hash, you would use it on multiple, multiple things concatenated together or something like that. You might want to increase Like you have multiple some categorical values. variables and you kind of link them together. Like privacy protection, of personal data or something like that. Oh, oh. Something. That's okay. So maybe that's what it's for. It's really about protecting privacy, that sort of thing. Because you could you could share this string and have it represent this, but not actually. So they wouldn't know what it is. They wouldn't yeah. know it was the North Ames neighborhood. They would. You would have to dig further to know that. Smaller hash. Uh, I, I didn't. I, I don't uh, know very much about this uh, under twenty-eight bit hash, uh, which means there are two powered uh, uh, under twenty-eight possible hash values and everything. So I don't number. deal very frequently with this <laughs> uh, with these things. But so far, uh, I understood it, you can encode as an hash, for example, this uh, percentage sign. Uh, 16. So you can reduce the number of uh, variables. The yeah. Or to... values. Yeah. I would probably just convert it to a factor and then store the factor as an integer. <laughs> it's the same thing. Yeah, exactly. That's, that's what I thought. It was the same. Um, and maybe the hash also randomizes it or something. 
I don't know. They, they, uh, here they use this string toy, toi, uh, and substring ash, uh, which is. Um, so at the end, you you found yourself with instead of having twenty eight neighborhoods, you have sixteen hash values. So reduce it the number of uh, categories. At least it makes the string a little nicer to read. Ah, oh, here you go. It's fast and memory efficient. Maybe doing factors and those sorts of things is a little slower. I'm not sure. Yeah. Um, so feature hashing, they hashed um, the neighborhood into a 16. 16 level hash, I mm -hmm. guess. And then the recipe is the same. I'm assuming that neighborhood as a as the formula in is 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 converted to this hash and then used. One question. One question. If can you scroll a bit up? Uh, sure, sure, sure. To yeah, the, here, to here, the here, here the, the code. Mm -hmm. They the some something I uh, I want to ask is, can you see that there's a step dummy ash as well as before, uh, and then a step with dummy again. So you think I'm, I'm doing step dummy to all nominal predictors, so I'm done. So, uh, so okay, so here in the, in the previous step, I'm reducing the number of categories in neighborhood, and then I do dummy variables again. What does step dummy do? It's the uh, one hot encoding, I think. Oh, so it takes, but it takes the nominal predictors? Oh, there you go. Traditional dummy variables. I'll make it a bit bigger for y'all. No, I have a giant monitor now, so I can read all these. <laughs> Let me make it smaller for Steven. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Oh, I'm good. <laughs> there we go. Um, nominal data characters or factors into one or more numeric binary model terms. So that's the one hot encoding. Thing. Right. That's yeah. what you said. So now we can believe you before. Thank you. No, not so much. <laughs> but like, but like, so you create the hash and then you you use the hash to create dummy variables? And this must just be... I, I feel like once you've created the hash, it, it has become a numeric variable, so it won't do the dummy variable then. It'll, it it won't, yeah, convert that one after you do hash. Yeah. I think right. this is another, yes. this is another <coughs> of those things where I wish somebody would just explain why the hell you would use hashing. Is it Hold on just privacy? a second. No, I actually carry on because I have yeah. a book that I have a book downstairs that actually talks about hashing. So I'm going to grab it real quick. So you can't interpret the because the hash functions cannot be reversed. So that's the privacy part of it, right? You're you don't know, I guess. I think you could figure it out, but. You just do it, run the model without hashing, compare the outputs and be like, well, that model, that neighborhood is category nine or hash nine, and the other one is hash one. Hash values is a tuning parameter. Uh, I was thinking that the hashing. Uh... Yeah, so the, the variable that we encoded in uh, within as a string, number, right? number and letters, for example. No? So when we ask, we, we transform them into number and letters. We cannot consider them numbers. No, they're strings. 
machine learning design. <laughs> <laughs> so this is a book I got from the library and it talks about hash pattern. The hash feature addresses three possible problems associated with categorical features, incomplete vocabulary, model size due to cardinality and cold start. So the incomplete vocabulary means like if a neighborhood we never saw before comes in, we wouldn't know what to do. But if we have the hash function, it will just assign it a value anyway. So, so that takes care of that. Um, high cardinality, I think we all understand. You know, if you have a thousand neighborhoods, that's gonna be problematic. And let's see. So Why on the other one, it says yeah, after- could, could you explain the high cardinality thing? I've heard it. Oh, just, I, I, just the high cardinality. So like if you have a thousand neighborhoods, then you have like a thousand variables. So that's gonna oh. cause you all kinds of potential trouble. Okay. Um, oh yeah, like the example they give in the book is we may not be able to deploy the model on smaller devices. So yeah, if you if you run into memory issues, stuff like that. Okay. Um, let's see. So yeah, this book is good. The machine learning design patterns. It talks about embeddings too. Um, is there an online version, free? What's that? Is there an online version which is free? I, I don't think so. <laughs> I wish. Could you drop a link to it in the chat or something, and then it'll. Pop I, I up for in sure. The, I for sure will do that. Yeah. It'll pop up in the Slack later. Yeah, I will do that definitely. Yeah, I'm kind of just switching through real quick. So, because they usually say like, "What's the problem that these cause?" But yeah. No, what's the problem that they solve? <laughs> Pro well, no, <laughs> the problem is a high cardinality <laughs> out of vocabulary input and cold start. But it's cold start is similar to the out of vocabulary according to this. So I don't understand why high cardinality would be fixed by this, though, although maybe that's what they're trying to do here. Oh, well, like the way you go down from like the number of neighborhoods to only 16 buckets. So then you would only have 16. You don't have. Um, but how yeah. does it how does it if it's it seems like it's random to me? How does it bucket? That, that, yeah, I mean, that's kind of interesting that, yeah, it ends up. There's, you could there's do it not, with like a PCA plot or something. It's not really based on um, reduce the things about the data. Yeah, yeah. Cluster. If you reduce so the says, dimensions and then cluster. You could take those clusters and say those are your fewer yeah, you're neighborhoods. Kind of, you kind of end up doing like averaging over neighborhoods. And I guess the fact that you kind of pick in the neighborhoods at random helps some. Okay. Um, so yeah, it says it is true hashing is lost. The, so they were using like an airport example. Okay. They say, since we have 347 airports, an average of 35 airports will get the same bucket code if we hash it to 10 buckets. The alter when the alternative is to discard the variable because it is too wide, a lossy encoding is acceptable compromise. So it's kind of the your mileage may vary thing. Yeah, I'll post the link in the chat. Sorry for the little tangent. I thought it might be helpful. It seems a little helpful. I don't know. A little, yeah. <laughs> okay. Excuse me. Well, so that's because that's what they're trying to point out here in terms of collisions, because they're mm -hmm. saying we we had 20 something odd neighborhoods and we encoded that to 16 variables. 16 mm -hmm. levels, whatever you want to call them. And so that means that there are multiple neighborhoods that are being, you know, put into the same category. Mm -hmm. um, and that's the part I'm a little confused on. It's like, why would you do that? You're, you're still doing so, some averaging. So I, I guess you're still getting information. You're getting information about that group. It's less granular than it was, I guess, perhaps. Yeah. It's like it's a trade-off. And if it's random, like, wouldn't you end up with? You could end up with one of those like lower the, cost neighborhoods being bulked together with a super high cost neighborhood, and the variance of that particular group would be huge. This is true. You get the fancy neighborhoods and the not fancy. I don't know. Just a thought. I'm just yeah. here to ask questions. It's good well, to ask yes. questions. Yes. What means uh, that um, they create uh, more? Uh, <coughs> they create more 
categories. Where you say, um, like when there's something that doesn't exist, that's what they're saying exactly. here. Yeah. They they put it into a, a bucket. So if we had 16 buckets, it would assign a new neighborhood into one of those 16 buckets. Right. And then you would that new neighborhood would have a category. Whereas if you had a brand new neighborhood and you tried to run the model and your would... neighborhood was part of the model, you wouldn't be able to compute it because that neighborhood isn't in the model. Yeah, I wouldn't know what to do with it. There's an example in the chapter uh, of this thing, maybe a little bit uh, up. Up. Yeah, they they, they uh, put them all, and you need to go uh, scroll up. This one? up. Further up. Yeah, further up, further up. Again, uh, more, a little bit more. I'm waiting every, a few seconds because yeah, 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 there's yeah. a bit of a delay. Oh, okay. <laughs> there, there, here. Uh, where is it? You see, mixed new levels at the bottom of the page. New levels are then encoded at close to the same values as with the general linear models. And then you, you have this uh, level new, which they have uh, highlighted, so selected to show you that there is a new level. So there were like, I don't know, uh, 28 and now are 29. So there's one more level. And it has a value. And as a value, yeah. Interesting. All right. So to mind that because it, for because of overfitting problems. Oh, overfitting. Okay. Do you want to go on to more encoding options? I feel bad because uh, Ryan's still not here. It's all right. Where is that guy? <coughs> he's probably stopping trains with his mind. All right. Yeah, he's, he's... <laughs> okay. More encoding options. Entity embeddings. Transform kind of water barrel to a set of lower dimensional vectors. So they mentioned, yes, both Kiras uh, uh, and tension, tension flow. They, uh, this, these models for encoding categorical variables can use neural network as well. Of course. <laughs> so there is a step in bed. Oh, number of hidden units again. Is that that was like twenty seven or something per layer? We did that. We set we set that in a previous uh, chapter. Right. Yeah. There was a, a, a neural, neural network. network of some sort, yeah. and they were like twenty seven. It's the magic number. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It was a minimum, I think, is what it was. Yeah. Oh, a minimum was 27. Yeah. Yeah. Although I can't remember why. And that's okay. It's Friday. Mm -hmm. um, and the step rule. How do you do it? Step? Step, I would say whoa, but whoa, you know. whoa gives me some whoa. Step whoa. <laughs> Weight of evidence transformation. The logarithm and the Bayes factor. Mm. The dictionary Step, mapping of each category level to a value. Mm. Step whoa functions. Okay. So posterior to the prior odds. So it's like a you you give it a prior right Bayes, and you say I think it's this, 
and then it comes back with the posterior odds. Yeah, based on your data. And then yeah. it's and then it does the ratio of those two things, and it's like, well, how close were you? And then that's mm -hmm. that's like that value is the uh, is what you used in your embeddings, I guess, mm -hmm. and that tells you. Yeah, how how strong how strong how right you were in your priors. Um, because often I I don't know if I haven't used Bayes stuff much, but like often you start with a 0.5 sort of thing, like mm -hmm. you don't know kind of thing. Like a flat that, prior. Yeah. An informative prior, they say. On it, yeah, yeah. Okay. There are a couple of interesting resources to look at for encoding categoricals. Here like, or further uh, down in the summary? Or down here yeah. in the references? Um, I put in the chat, I, uh, in, the, in the book, in the reference, uh, within the reference of the book, yeah. Okay. One is this one, uh, and uh, you can see is, um, what is it? One is Michi. Uh, Barreca Daniele, year 2001, a people assessed scheme for high cardinality categorical attributes in classification and predict prediction problems. Uh, so they talk about a bit of, of, of these things and they hmm. uh, do a list of, uh, um, where is it? Uh, a list of possible uh, encodings. So you basically can encode an ordered when in presence of high number of categories, and um, this uh, as this categorization can be challenging. Um, like they, they can arise uh, cases with infinite values or invalid values, NA to many categorical levels. So those things, so they explain a bit why you need to encode, uh, you need encoding, basically. And the other one, uh, they mentioned, what is it? Is it Weinberger? Mm, no, I think it's the, the first one, Entity Embedding of Categorical Variables, this uh, Guo Cheng, this Guo Cheng. Cheng. Uh, and the voice that's opening that up as well. This is Michi. Oh, are you putting links? Uh, no, Zumel and Mount. Uh, it's it's in the uh, it's in the book. It's at the Zumel end of the chapter, yeah. Oh, there it is. Okay. Yeah, that's nice as well. You need uh you need to download the the PDF, but you can see it clearly. And they they're, yeah, they're on archive. Yeah. Some of them anyway. Yeah. That, that yeah. was the thing I was mentioning. Well, the previous one is. Uh, yeah. I, I have a generic question, a general question about all this, like the high cardinality categorical stuff. If that. Doesn't that just tell you something like, like maybe you don't have the right data in your data set? You know, like if you, like why, why would you depend on a string like that for, that is uninterpretable to the computer in terms of like uh, being non-numeric? Like I guess I don't see, I don't understand the value of trying to encode that into buckets that are random and so on and so forth. <clears throat> I think it still gives you um, information that you could use for predictions, but yeah, it kind of does uh, throw away some of the interpretability of it. 
definitely. I, I saw like somebody was saying, you know, referring to it as just leaving information on the table. If you, yeah, it's it's like if you have too high cardinality and you, you know, you might be inclined to say, well, don't even use it, but there are ways to still still use that. So I guess that's kind of what this is saying. So they're, you're trying to eke out every little last bit you can in terms of right. power. Right. Yeah, you're trying to kind of strike a balance between capturing everything that you have, but then not just totally blowing up your model, I guess, with, uh, you know, yeah, the data frame of death. Interesting. Uh, so there are things you can do, I guess, also with like um, XG boost, at least where you do like a, a sparse matrix. So you're not you don't actually have the massive data frame. So that's like another way to deal with that kind of situation. But I think at tidy models, yeah, I don't know if they have that just generally where you could use sparse model or matrix, sorry. Well, you can use XG boost, right? So yeah, and I think you can pass in a, uh, a sparse matrix. But I don't, yeah, I don't know if that works for everything. I don't know if everything can handle that approach. Mm. Yeah. Okay, well, just tools in the toolkit, I guess. So, yeah, the take home message is here in this last sentence. Use a different model. Uh, <laughs> okay. Come on now. What are you trying to do with these encoders? We'll go with the tree. <laughs> go with the tree. Uh, any other comments? I don't have any more no. questions. No. I'm run out. Um, I'm, I'm yeah. Out. Just uh, to conclude and say that uh, you can do uh, no pooling when you do automatically making groups and everything. So like you grouping your categorical and then encoding with another variable, another predictor, and then partial pooling, and then the hashing. So those three are the, the, the main, uh, the main things. And then you have so three methods mentioned, the effect of likelihood encodings, future hashing, and then entity embeddings, the which is the last one. We I didn't I didn't get that very much. They didn't show it. It does and exist. There it is. We can on top of the page we can build a full set of entity embeddings. So this thing is the last, the, the last bit. That's the same thing. Here we go, the learning objectives. <laughs> there were no objectives. We did great. We learned a bunch without any uh, objectives, so. <laughs> I just thought I'd look just to see what was there. <laughs> Usually there's like 12 objectives, so. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, it looks like this uh, chapter needs some love. I guess maybe one of us can go in and add something. <laughs> We certainly have some links to some materials. It looks like that could this be quite useful, especially your book that you you've, you've I, shared. Yeah, this book I think is is pretty nice because it talks about things you could do with data, but then it also talks about things you could do with your um, deployment and stuff. So it's kind of just your, all around good stuff. Your, your deployment, like yeah, like when you deploy your model, or something? yeah. Oh, yeah. oh, okay. Resilient, yeah. resilient serving. Hmm. So reproducibility is nice. Oh, responsible AI, fairness lens, so that you don't, you know, discriminate against people. That's good. So yeah, it's a pretty good book all around. Cool. <clears throat> all right. Anything else from anyone? All right. I'll stop cool. sharing. Thank Thanks, you. Brandon. <laughs> we got through it. We I did it. the questions. <laughs> Spirited. Um, I hope y'all go forward. We had a good yeah. time. Yeah. All right. Well, have a good day.
Happy we'll uh, see you next week for chapter 18 on models and predictors. Sounds good. All right. Take see care, you. all. Have a Bye. good weekend.